My name is Greg Ivers. I'm a professor of government in the School of Public Affairs at American University, and welcome to the fifth chapter in my ongoing series, Hidden Civil Rights History in the Washington, D.C. area. It is a beautiful Sunday afternoon here in Washington, D.C. I'm standing at 1100 New York Avenue, which is located between 11th and 12th Streets Northwest. On a normal day, and as we know for the last year, this has certainly not been a normal time, thousands of people walk by this address every single day, but very few, if any of them, understand the historical significance of where I am right now. Today, 1100 New York Avenue is a mid-sized office building. It houses, as far as I can tell, the U.S. International Finance Corporation and a law firm whose services I might need one day, so I'll decline to mention its name. But from 1940 well into the 1980s, this site served as the Greyhound bus terminal. In fact, if you take a look over my left shoulder, you can see on the entryway into the building the original Greyhound logo. This site would be forever immortalized on May 4, 1961, when the first six of the 13 men and women known as the Freedom Riders pulled out of this bus terminal bound for New Orleans, where they were scheduled to arrive on May 17th. That date was chosen to commemorate the seventh anniversary of the Supreme Court's landmark Brown v. Board of Education decision, which made state-mandated racial segregation in public schools unconstitutional. The other seven Freedom Riders would depart from the Trailways bus station that was once located at 12th and L Streets Northwest, just about two blocks north of here. Unfortunately, there is no sign, no marker, no anything to commemorate the historic import of these two addresses. The night before their departure, the Freedom Riders had dinner at what was once one of D.C.'s most high-end Chinese restaurants, Yenching Palace, located in the 3500 block of Connecticut Avenue Northwest in a neighborhood known here as Cleveland Park. Yenching Palace is now, surprise, a Walgreens. The restaurant was managed by Paul Dietrich, who was active in the Howard University-based affiliate of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Nonviolent Action Group, or, as the inside joke went, NAG. And for some of the riders, most notably John Lewis, this was their first Chinese meal. The Freedom Rides were organized and sponsored by the Congress of Racial Equality, better known as CORE, to test compliance in the Deep South with two separate Supreme Court decisions and a ruling by the Interstate Commerce Commission outlawing racial segregation and interstate bus travel. In 1946, the Supreme Court in Morgan v. Virginia ruled that racial segregation and in interstate transportation was unconstitutional. Nine years later, the Interstate Commerce Commission issued a separate ruling in Keyes v. the South Carolina Coach Company that racial segregation and interstate bus travel specifically violated the Interstate Commerce Act. In 1960, the Supreme Court ruled in Boynton v. Virginia that racial segregation and in interstate transportation facilities was unconstitutional. And if you've seen my video on the legacy of the Howard Law School, you'll remember that Thurgood Marshall argued both the Morgan and Boynton cases and that Dovey Roundtree argued the case before the ICC. When the Freedom Riders left D.C., they did so against the advice of the NAACP and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Both organizations were concerned that the Riders would meet violence and possibly death. The Kennedy administration, which had been attempting to keep the growing grassroots element of the civil rights movement at an arm's length, also counseled against the rides, telling the core leadership and the journalists who would travel with them that there was really nothing they could do but to call them if they ran into any trouble. Undeterred by reports that Deep South law enforcement would not protect them and that an unconstrained Ku Klux Klan was prepared to pounce as soon as they got into Alabama, the two buses pulled out on that May 4th morning, beginning what became one of the most frightening, memorable, and significant direct action campaigns of the Southern Civil Rights Movement. Now, let's meet the original 13 Freedom Riders and the journalists that accompanied them out of Washington, D.C. 41-year-old James Farmer was the national director of CORE, which he co-founded in 1942 in Chicago to promote racial integration through nonviolent direct action. A Marshall, Texas native, Farmer was a 14-year-old student at the historically black Wiley College when he was recruited to join the school's renowned debate team. In 1935, Wiley College made national news when it defeated the University of Southern California for the National College Debate Championship. In April 1947, Farmer helped organize the Journey of Reconciliation, a two-week bus trip sponsored by Corps through Virginia, North Carolina, Kentucky, and Tennessee to test the Supreme Court's Morgan decision. The riders, who consisted of 16 men, evenly divided between white and black, encountered some minor resistance but met no major violence. Farmer did not participate in that ride. 
But Jim Peck, a fellow charter member of Corps and its national publicity director, did take part in the 1947 trip. Peck had worked with Farmer to organize the 1961 campaign, and together they came up with the phrase Freedom Rides to attract national attention and make clear that this was to be a direct test of the segregated South's resistance. Peck would suffer some of the worst beatings of any of the participants when the Freedom Rides got into Alabama weeks later. A native of Chevy Chase, Maryland, a suburb just over the D.C. line, Cornell University graduate Genevieve Hughes was a 28-year-old financial analyst working in New York before leaving to work for CORE full-time as a field secretary in the late 1950s. Jimmy McDonald was a 29-year-old folk singer living in New York City who had cut his political teeth working on Progressive Party candidate Henry Wallace's 1948 presidential campaign. During the 1950s, McDonald had become active in CORE first by playing fundraisers and later as a participant in its direct action campaigns to support the students in the Southern movement. Joe Perkins grew up in Owensboro, Kentucky and attended historically black institutions Kentucky State University and Howard University before transferring to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor where he soon became active in local direct action efforts aimed at desegregating public accommodations. 27 years old, Perkins, like Hughes, had recently gone to work for CORE full-time as a field secretary. Ed Blankenheim, pictured here with James Farmer, was a 27-year-old Korean War veteran and father of two young children when he journeyed 2,000 miles from Tucson, Arizona to take part in the Freedom Rides. A Midwesterner who split his formative years between his native Minnesota and Chicago, Blankenheim was active in student chapters of the NAACP and CORE when he settled in Tucson after his military service. 55-year-old Massachusetts native and Connecticut resident Burt Bigelow was a World War II veteran and architect who spent his post-war years as a dedicated anti-nuclear activist. By the late 1950s, Bigelow had developed an international reputation for his work in the pacifist and anti-nuclear movements, causes that would drive him for the remainder of his life. 21-year-old Troy, Alabama native John Lewis had already earned notoriety for his leadership role in the Nashville student movement while attending the American Baptist Theological Seminary, having been arrested and beaten multiple times by May 1961. A founding member and future chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Lewis emerged from the Freedom Rides, where he was beaten on multiple occasions with an even more visible national profile lauded for both his physical and spiritual courage while remaining steadfastly committed to nonviolence. In 1986, Lewis was elected to Congress and represented his adopted city of Atlanta in the House of Representatives for 17 consecutive terms until his death in July 2020. 61-year-old Michigan native Walter Bergman, pictured here between James Farmer and Hank Thomas, was a retired college professor and union organizer long active in social causes. He was joined by his wife, Frances, 57, a retired elementary school educator and fellow progressive activist. The Bergmans were the oldest of the original Freedom Riders. They had begun working with CORE in the late 1950s to organize boycotts and pickets in Detroit against businesses and public facilities that discriminated against African Americans. The Freedom Rides would be their first experience in the Deep South. 29-year-old Elton Cox was the only member of the clergy to participate in the original Freedom Rides. Reverend Cox was pastoring a church in High Point, North Carolina, when Jim Farmer reached out to him to take part in the rides, believing it was important for the country to see that clergy were committed to this direct action campaign. Cox earned the nickname Belton Elton for his loud and proud singing to keep the riders' spirits up. Hank Thomas, at 19, the second youngest freedom rider, grew up in Northern Florida. A Howard University sophomore and founding member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Thomas was the second youngest freedom rider. He earned a spot on the initial rides after his roommate, John Moody, became ill and recommended that Thomas take his place. Thomas was among the passengers on the Greyhound bus that was bombed and burned in Anniston, Alabama. Charles Person, an 18-year-old Atlanta native and Morehouse College freshman, was the youngest freedom rider. He had just served a 16-day jail sentence in the weeks leading up to the Freedom Rides for his role in the Atlanta sit-in movement being led by the city's black colleges. In April 2021, Person published a memoir about his experience called Buses Are Comin', a first-hand account of a Freedom Rider. The first of the three journalists who accompanied the Freedom Riders out of Washington was 43-year-old Simeon Booker, who is perhaps the most prominent black journalist in the country. Booker had earned praise for his coverage of the 1955 lynching of Emmett Till for Jet Magazine. 
then the most popular news weekly among black Americans. Booker will continue to cover the unfolding Southern Civil Rights Movement, publishing a book, Black Man's America, in 1964. Ted Gaffney was a photographer based in Washington, D.C. The 33-year-old Army veteran had also been asked by Jet Magazine to cover the Freedom Rides. Gaffney later commented that photographers were considered more threatening than some of the riders because they were there to document and transmit the events for all the world to see. Finally, Charlotte DeVries was a 50-year-old New York-based freelance journalist who had been active in Corps as a publicist and organizer. DeVries was also a passenger on the Greyhound bus that was attacked in Anniston. The original Freedom Riders planned route took them through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and then down to Atlanta, Georgia. From Atlanta, they were to travel to Birmingham and Montgomery, Alabama, then Jackson, Mississippi, before ending in New Orleans. There was some resistance and a few arrests in Virginia, but the riders did not confront any violence until they arrived in Rock Hill, South Carolina, a small town just over the North Carolina border. John Lewis and Burt Bigelow were beaten for attempting to use the whites-only waiting room, and Genevieve Hughes was pushed to the ground when she attempted to intervene. A few days later, the riders met with Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders in Atlanta, and during their meeting, King whispered to Jet reporter Simeon Booker that he had heard on good authority that the Freedom Riders would never make it through Alabama. The Riders continued to Birmingham via Anniston, Alabama, and it was there that literally the wheels came off the bus. On Sunday, May 14th, the Greyhound bus was met by a violent mob of over 100 people. Before the bus's arrival, Anniston local authorities had given permission to the Ku Klux Klan to strike against the Freedom Riders without fear of arrest. One of the buses was firebombed, and its fleeing passengers were forced into an angry white mob. The violence continued in Birmingham after the Trailways bus, which had managed to escape the worst of the violence in Anniston, pulled into the terminal. Birmingham Public Safety Commissioner Eugene Bull Connor had told the Klan they could have 15 minutes to do whatever they wanted to the riders, and the police would not interfere. The sheer brutality of the violence while the police stood by drew national and international attention, none of it flattering. But the viciousness of the attacks prompted James Farmer, who had left the rides in Atlanta after learning of his father's death, to end the Freedom Rides. Farmer's decision frustrated student activists, who pleaded with him not to let the violence end the campaign. Diane Nash, the leader of the Nashville student movement, organized a new group of students that included original writer John Lewis and sent them to Birmingham. Lewis left the rides in Rock Hill not because of the injuries he sustained, but to fly to Philadelphia to interview for a prestigious fellowship to study abroad. Many senior figures in the movement, including Dr. King, remain hesitant about the students' determination to keep going. Even James Farmer was uncertain as well, questioning whether the continuing the trip was, in his own words, suicide. But just as many, if not more, supported the students and even offered to join them. On May 20th, the Freedom Rides resumed. John Siegenthaler, a Department of Justice representative accompanying the Freedom Riders, forced Alabama Governor John Patterson to provide police protection for the buses leaving Birmingham for Montgomery. At the Montgomery City Line, the state troopers, as agreed, ended their escort, but the local police that had been ordered to meet the Freedom Riders in Montgomery never appeared. Unprotected when they entered the Greyhound Terminal, the riders were beaten so severely by a white mob that some sustained permanent injuries. When the police finally arrived, they served the riders with an injunction barring them from continuing the Freedom Rides in Alabama and made no arrests of the locals who had taken up where the Klan in Birmingham had left off. Floyd Mann, the director of Alabama Public Safety, arrived at the Montgomery bus terminal and fired a shot in the air that ended the melee. Mann was outraged that local Montgomery law enforcement, working with the Klan, allowed a repeat of Birmingham after he publicly promised to protect the Freedom Riders. There were a few more contentious days in Montgomery, including a failed effort by the Klan and their supporters to storm the church where the Riders had taken refuge. Only federal marshals and a deputized Alabama National Guard surrounding the church prevented another round of violence. On May 24th and 25th, the next wave of riders rolled out of Montgomery, bound for Jackson, Mississippi, under the protection of Alabama law enforcement, the National Guard, and federal marshals. Buses and trains full of Freedom Riders continued to arrive in Jackson from cities all throughout the South over the next several weeks. By then, Jim Farmer had rejoined the rides, and he was later arrested as well. 
Other prominent senior figures in the Southern movement soon joined the Freedom Rides, as did clergy, students, and just everyday people of all ages from all parts of the country. Every single Freedom Rider was arrested as soon as they stepped off the train or bus in Jackson, and many spent their summers in some of the state's worst jails, including the notorious Parchman Farm. On May 29, 1961, the Kennedy administration directed the Interstate Commerce Commission to ban racial segregation in all transportation facilities under its jurisdiction. But the South refused to give in and the rides continued. Throughout the spring, summer, and fall of 1961, 436 men and women took somewhere between 60 and 70 freedom rides throughout the Jim Crow South. On November 1st, the Interstate Commerce Commission's directive ordering the end to segregated transportation and transportation facilities went into effect, and the signs marking separate facilities based on race were placed into the trash cans, never to return. And remember, the next time you walk past 1100 New York Avenue, you're not just walking past a tastefully restored Art Deco office building. You are literally walking in the shadows of history. I hope you've enjoyed the fifth chapter of my ongoing series, Hidden Civil Rights History in the Washington, D.C. area. And I hope you've learned something as well.